Hey, everybody, welcome to week 158. We are calling in from the former headquarters of SVB. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm still in my office, <laughs> but Jack is somewhere really special. <laughs> and then we have Adam with us, but not Adam Boatsman. I think he is with his family doing something really fun, shooshing down some slopes. I think that's what he's doing, but I'm not sure. Uh, or he's on his way there. I hope I hope that's the case, which is cool. But Adam Petrikoff with VR Business Brokers is going to be on here. So this is going to be a rock'em sock'em day going into like, all right, what's happening with the markets a little bit. We're not going to go deep into that. We're going to talk a little bit about SVB and this whole banking mess. Um, and what does that mean? But especially in light of the capital markets and buying, selling businesses, because a lot of you guys um, are either, either thinking about buying or thinking about selling. What does all this mean? What do I do? And hopefully we can de demystify some of that stuff for you today. So if you are new to this forum, there's a little button at the bottom called Q&A. That means questions and answers. You just hit that type in your questions and we will answer that for free. Um, and if you want to harass us like Papa Joe and some other folks, uh, you can hit us up on the chat and you can uh, chat us up on that too. And I'll be monitoring that. So, um, and yes, the big dance is beginning. The NCAA tournament, I'm really sorry that those Tar Heels ain't in it. Like that's just such a bummer. So if you're a Tar Heel, fan root for the Kansas State Wildcats which is why I'm wearing purple today so <laughs> there you go and Adam I was like I think Adam was looking like he's got a little purple but it's it's the blue and the red you know for you, all you KP, KU people blue and red does make purple so there you go just another little art lesson for you all right Jack show us where you're at give us a little bit of background all right coming in hot from the New York Stock Exchange trade floor. And so um, came here to kind of find out what was really going on and ask some questions of some people who know more than I do about uh, banks and bank collapses and impact on um, stocks and, and everything else. So um, the, the people that I asked, so uh, here's what they had to say, essentially. So um, the bank, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, it catered to the tech industry for three decades, so for over 30 years, and it collapsed on March 10th. So what, what does that mean, really? So um, they say that it was an old-fashioned bank run, that people went to go get their money out where they had uh, previously given it to the bank. So the FDIC, you know, that acronym that you see every time you walk into a bank or you go on the internet and go into your bank account and you see FDIC, that's the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, basically took over the bank. And um, so they're saying, why did this happen? Um, why did the bank collapse happen? Well, as these people came in and started demanding their money, they didn't physically have the money to give back to them. So what typically happens, and, and I'm sorry for being remedial a little bit, but what typically happens is with, when you give your bank the, your money, they take it and they make sure that you know it's, it's under your account, but then they utilize it in various ways. And typically most banks will give the money out to other people. So if you have a loan on your car, if you have a mortgage, if you have you know some a home equity line, that those are other people using your money and we do too we have um, all of those so um but they wanted their cash back and there wasn't enough cash to go around um so what had happened was from my understanding as i've interviewed people around me as i'm sitting here in the new york stock exchange is that um so what they what happened was is that they were not permitted to lend out or they couldn't lend out the money as it's traditionally done. So they want to do something with the money. So they put it in U.S. treasuries, which are typically pretty safe, um, except when interest rates rise and then you have issues. And um, I'll let maybe Adam discuss that as to how that uh, you know kind of manifests itself, or we can talk about it further. But just assume that 
as interest rates rise, it's not such a great thing um, for U.S. Treasuries. And so um, what happened was, is that as people wanted these monies back, um, the, the this particular bank said it took a 1.8 billion hit on the sale of some of those securities and were unable to raise capital to offset the losses as the stock began dropping. So um, that's basically what happened, which led to this. Um, at the end of 2022, this bank had 175.4 billion in deposits. It's not sure how much remain with the bank and how many, how much of that is insured. I think that the insurance rate is $250,000 capped per lender. And so um, that's anything over 250, then it's basically uninsured. Um, let's see, last bank to fail was in October, 2020, which is um, <clears throat> for, unfortunately the Almena State Bank, is that how you say that? It's in Kansas. Um, and First City Bank of Florida, which were also taken over by the FDIC, but those banks are relatively small, about 200 million in deposits combined. Um, <clears throat> the risk that more banks might fail is low. Uh, and the reason being is, is that um, even though SVB was the 16th largest bank in the United States with 209 billion in assets, that's just 0.91%. So not even a full percentage point of all banking assets in the U.S. Um, so there's little risk that this bank's failure will spill over into other banks. Um, and um, the good news is, is that most banks have enough capital to cover what uh, um, is has been deposited. I'm not suggesting that you go and prove that theory and going out and start uh put your ATM card in the machine and start asking it for money and putting it under your mattress or anything like that. But um, I, I am not losing any sleep at night knowing that the money that I have in um, several banks and other investments um, is not going to um, evaporate overnight anytime soon. So that is the general background on what is going on because I've received a lot of questions. I know that Gary and Adam have received a lot of questions about what does all this really mean? Um, and a lot of speculation. And then you have the, um, you know, conspiracy theorists and the ones that want to incite panic um, and those that are trying to calm people down and say, I'm not saying don't worry about it, but I mean, it's not, um, you, you know, the bank's hairs are not on fire that you need to go and get your stuff out. So, so that's it. Uh, the one thing that I would add to that is if you are wanting to take your money out and, and, you know, put it in a safe place. My backyard, I will dig the holes. I'll remember where it is at. It'll be very safe in my backyard. So, <laughs> oh, and by the way, uh, Papa Joe asks, <laughs> yes, you are on. It's good to see you, Joe. Um, so he said, is the stock exchange closed today? And I told him the obvious answer, which is that Jack gave everybody on the floor Starbucks cards, courtesy of Shoemaker Law, they all have a coffee break so that he could hear himself and so that we would be undistracted because it's very noisy down there. So they will be back at noon. So if you're worried about trades and stuff like that, just wait until noon Eastern time. All right. So um, we got a nice crew on here today. Um, <laughs> the interest in I have a lot of interest if somebody puts their money in my backyard. So uh, Robert Mayetta, how much interest does your backyard pay? I pay a lot of it interest. I'm, I'm very interested in anybody wanting to put money in there. So it's it's immeasurable. Robert. You, pay in, you pay in magical beans too, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Pine straw. Um, so with Without further ado, let's tee up Adam Petrikoff. And one of the things is it is kind of serendipitous, actually. We we did not plan on SVB <laughs> creating the chaos that they did when, when we decided, hey, we're going to have Adam Petrikoff on here because he did a really good um, presentation. We had a very good dialogue with him for our uh, number of our quarterbacks at BGW as to like what's happening in the mergers and acquisitions world out there. What's that marketplace looking like? What's happening with capital? Are deals getting done? Have they dried up? You know, what's what's going on? And he did a really good job. So we asked Adam Petrikoff to come in and 
kind of share his wisdom and what he had done with us so that you guys can ask. And so uh, we do have a couple questions on here. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> Derek. <laughs> oh, Derek. Uh, yeah, so he uh, he is a banker. <laughs> so he says, wouldn't it help if everyone had to watch the bank run from It's a Wonderful Life? Yes, it would, Derek. Absolutely. And um, one other question here that is actually a comment from Joe, you might note that the big banks, Bank of America, Chase, et cetera, have benefited tremendously from SVB failure, inflow of billions of dollars of deposits. Oh, yes. And uh, if if I remember right, uh, Derek, who is with another one of those big banks, said, hey, just let your people know we're taking deposits. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know. In every crisis, there are the winners and there are losers. And the winners are those that are in a position and they pivot and they seize that opportunity. So there you go. Um, what I'd like to do is be a winner, though, for anybody that is afraid and they do want to bury their, their money. Uh, I pay a lot of interest. So let's go ahead. And Adam, go ahead and give us a shout. Um, introduce yourself. Give them a little bit of your background, too, because I think your background is really interesting with your family business. It's not like you just went into business brokerage. You you actually know what it's like uh, being in a family business. And then let's talk about what's happening in the market. Sure. Well, well thanks, Gary and, and Jack, for letting me join you. And thanks, everyone, for watching this. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in a fourth generation, 93-year-old family business. We sold, we were in the textile business in 1998, which brought me down here. Um, so I've been part, uh, we were a, a hundred plus million dollar business and um, multiple generations, family members. Uh, I, I've been through those very interesting discussions and it's, it's part of what led me to get into this business uh, many years ago. Um, before I sort of jump into the the market and and give sort of some really live what's going on, I I'd just like to make a couple sort of uh, public service announcements. One, turn off CNBC. Um, two, stop looking at your phone every five minutes for the market update and your portfolio update. Uh, we're all in this for the long term. There's going to be ups and downs and sideways, and and just you know. Please don't overreact to, you know, you, you, I looked at a bank stock yesterday in the morning. I looked in the day at the end, it was down 10 cents. And then I went and looked during the day. At one point it was down like 17%, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, it hadn't moved. Um, keep, keep focus on the long term. The other public service announcement I would make is you should be in touch with your banker. If your banker has not reached out to you this week, it might be a good idea to consider talking with a new bank because you should have a relationship with your banker. And I'm amazed how many business owners, when and we learned it during PPP, when you don't have a relationship with your banker and you need them, um, now's the time before there's another issue. And there will be an issue. Uh, start working on that bank relationship. Um, the, the final public service announcement I would make when you call your banker is if you are sitting on cash and you have not requested that they start paying you market rates in your money market, um, you have to demand it. They will not call you up and voluntarily go from 0.01% to you know 3.2 to 3.9%, which you should probably be getting for a bank. There's other ways to make more money uh, outside of your bank, but make sure that any excess cash you do have is making money for you. So um, that, that those are sort of the public service announcements. Um, hey, and Adam, so, let me jump in on that real quick yeah. too. Uh, you are absolutely right about that with the banks. I have been with PNC for freaking ever. Um, yeah, I was with Bank of America when I was a, a client. And then when I was in Ohio, they didn't have Bank of America branches up there. So I moved to PNC and I think I was getting 0.1%. And I, I call and they had reached out to me because they're like, Hey, you know, you need to have a business banker, blah, blah, blah. So I said, Hey, actually I'm thinking about shopping. And uh, we went from 0.1 to four 
four percent from like 0.1 to four percent yeah in six months and then you know cds right now 12 month cd is five and a 5.35 uh that i just got from pnc too so uh you're absolutely right about that and one final thing is anybody listening to that to, to today's deal um thank you joe it's, he said bgw reached out before our banker did yeah we we jumped on it fast and um if you are not a client of bgw and you want to see kind of what we submitted and sent out i think it was on monday um let me know in the chat give me your email and i'll make sure that we send that to you you know there's probably plenty of other stuff that came out since then but we jumped on it first thing monday morning so uh thank you let me hit one more question before we dive deeper um does f oh the good question robert does fdic cover cds and money market accounts at a bank i don't know that question answer you guys know that Hey, Derek, not CDs. you would they don't know. cover CDs. Derek, I know they don't cover CDs. Uh, Derek, if you would weigh in on this one and let us know, because I know you're still on here, I think, unless you popped off. But um, any bankers on here, let us know. Does FDIC cover CDs and money market accounts at the bank? I think, you know, at the last crash, 2008, we had money in money markets that were not FDIC insured. And I called my wife and I said, have them throw everything into FDIC accounts. So I don't think so. And I doubt that CDs do, but any bankers on here, let us know. All right. Sorry, Adam. Keep No keep problem. Going. So let, let's, let's talk about the market. We, we get lots of questions, you know, every week, whether there's, there's a crisis or not, everyone always wants to know, What's going into what's going on in the market? The market changes all the time. It's a different market than it was 12 months ago, which is a different market than it was, uh, you know, 24 months ago. Uh, I can definitively tell you that deals are absolutely getting done, a hundred percent. The latest uh, Firmex is a big deal that monitors uh, private transactions, and and for most of this conversation, I'm going to talk about what I would call main street and lower middle market. So basically you're, you're one to uh, say 75 to $100 million market, okay? Um, deals are absolutely getting done. Uh, they're anticipated to be up about 15 to 17% over Q4 of 2022. Um, the biggest thing going on right now is obviously everyone's paying attention to higher interest rates. And while that is... Uh, I would say that's eliminating many first-time buyers, the professional buyers, the private equity, the family office, the seasoned entrepreneurs that want to add on to their business. They're moving full steam ahead. The biggest problem in the M&A market today is there are not enough quality businesses for sale. So what does that mean? It means a couple of things. One, there's a lot of junk out there. There's a lot of businesses that are barely making money that the sellers still think is worth a lot of money and buyers are more discriminating than ever if you have a good cash flow business and you don't have 90 percent of it with one customer and you've got a good management team and you've got great financials uh, prepared by bgw and you've got no lawsuits that jack will keep you out of all the obvious things if you're doing the the basics and you're considering going to market right now it's a great time to go to market because there's less competition uh, from other businesses being on the market right now. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's sort of like the real estate market. Um, we have not recovered from pre-COVID amounts of businesses on the market. If I had more high quality businesses, I would be able to sell more, uh, more close more transactions. So we're not, um, you know, so there is a great market for good businesses. There is not a good market for businesses that are just doing marginal or, oh, it's got all this potential. People want businesses that are cash flowing. I always tell sellers, listen, you can't pay uh, your monthly note to the bank on potential. It's got to be cash flow. 
So now is the time, if you're not ready, work on the, the obvious things that, that you know, any one of us on, on this uh, uh, webinar can talk to you about. It's about cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Now, are banks lending is, is one of the questions that are, I get asked. And the answer is absolutely. Um, there are some industries that are uh, challenged. Uh, people are still not jumping into all of the restaurant uh, spaces in a post-COVID world. Um, there are uh, there's more scrutiny going into a borrower's background, i.e., their experience. Um, maybe a little more uh, down payment. Uh, in in many cases, still, if if you're in the SBA world, it's still in in, in typically in the ten percent down, but. Um, there are some people that are looking at conventional because they don't want to pay the higher interest rates uh, in SBA deals. But I can tell you, not only are lenders lending, I've spoken with some lenders this week, and they're saying that they actually may be getting more aggressive because they're worried about the back half, and they want to make sure that their loan production is hitting their 2022 levels. So um, lenders are absolutely lending. Yes, rates are up. And what I tell you is, you're buying this business for the next five, 10 years. If you're a buyer, interest rates will come down. So if they're cash flowing at these higher elevated rates, they're only your, your, your cash flow is only going to increase in the future when you can uh, adjust your rate or, or refinance it. So um, again, interest rates impacting some deals, not a lot. Um, if, if the business is strong cash flow, there's no problem getting, getting lenders. The biggest challenge out there in the market right now I see are sellers' expectations and buyers' expectations. Buyers are convinced that it is a buyer's market. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, it isn't. Uh, and it goes back to... Um, what I said earlier, there's not as many uh, businesses out there. And just, again, if you're trying to go after real estate and there's not a lot of homes and you want to buy a home in that neighborhood, you know, there, there's going to be competition. And so, um, you know, the expectation on the seller side is that this is going to be easy and quick. And that is also incorrect. Today, we're seeing more due diligence than ever. Um, instead of 60 to 90 days and maybe 60, 90 in some cases, 120 days between signing what we call a letter of intent uh, till it actually closing. And Jack, you know, just want to ask you, I mean, you're from a legal side. I know you're seeing more due diligence and, and more stuff being asked about a business and the transactions. Just wanted to, you know, confirm what, what I'm seeing uh, from a due diligence perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, there many times in the past, some assumptions or some, OK, we'll deal with that post-closing. And it's no, we need to make sure that everything is on board, or everybody's on board. Um, went through a closing earlier this week that got postponed from last week because there were little loose ends that normally be like, oh, okay, we'll take a leap of faith, we'll deal with it afterwards. And the bank was absolutely um, you know, saying not. We need to have all these loose ends tied up. And I, I told the client, because they were a little bit frustrated that um, this is just kind of the way it is now. And you know, the bank has the money and they're not going to push a button to let it out until they feel like they are completely, um, uh, they have their their checklist complete. And that's kind of what's happening is you have bankers that are doing their jobs or attorneys that are doing their jobs that they have a list. And as long as they don't have a check, a check in one box, they're going to hold up the entire thing. And so we just have to, we have to play in that world now and have to deal with it. And so that's why um, as an adjunct comment to to um, yours, as far as doing the deal, um, we're very much a proponent of having a checklist of documents, of processes, of signatures, so that we have our own checklist. And if there's something that isn't happening, for example, um, in another transaction, there were three assignments that were needed from three different landlords. The one in Charlotte was giving us a hard time about releasing the guarantors. Um, and we were on the sell side. And so it's like, okay, um, my guys are like, are you going to take a leap of faith? Um, they are continuing on with the business uh, and as employees of the business that they just sold. And so the likelihood of something happening bad with the new tenant, which is their buyers, is very low. There's still some risk. So, um, and ultimately our clients were okay with it. 
but the bank wasn't okay with it. So here, there, you know, here we are again in a situation where normally it'd be okay to kind of take a leap of faith, but it's just not happening. So yeah, yeah. sorry, long-winded response to your question. No, it's great. I mean, checklists got to be completed now. In the past, maybe you could get way. And I'm going to touch on landlords in a minute because that is a huge, huge issue right now that uh, has gotten worse, not better. Um, here's a good piece of news. Uh, maybe one of the first uh, times any of us can report that there is something good related to the year 2020. Um, in most deals now, uh, and going forward in 2023, uh, uh, Buyers, lenders, and valuation firms are essentially ignoring 2020, the financials. Uh, they're looking back at your maybe your 2018, 2019, uh, seeing where you were, where your profits, where your margins were, uh, and then looking at it, comparing it to 21 and really 22. And once they see that you're back and or above 2019, everyone knows what happened in 2020. And, and like I said, lenders are essentially not even you know, largely counting on 2020. Everyone knows what happened. We don't need to put footnotes and explanations. Um, everyone knows Q2 of 2020 was a, was a disaster for everybody. So that's good news. Um, it's great news if you've, if you've had a really good 21 and 22, um, because really businesses um, are being valued on that and, and traded on that. So that is, that is good. The other thing I want to touch on that I can't stress with uncertainty, with questions, et cetera, is your advisors, your team around you, you're, you're the, if you're the owner, you're the seller. And by the way, this applies to if you're the owner and you're looking to buy. I can't tell you how much more, we just talked about due diligence is longer, the process is longer, how much more important your advisors around you are. They're, they've never been more important. So you need to make sure you have your accountant. You need to make sure you have your attorney. You need to make sure a financial advisor, a bank, maybe your insurance, you know, someone like myself, a broker or an, or an m and advisor. Um, obviously, most importantly, your family. I can't tell you how important each one of those silos are in the deal because they're just critical. And there are things that are going on, just like this all sprang out of, of um, COVID and, and what, what Gary and Jack have been able to do this, they're making themselves available. When you get into a transaction, and many people get one chance to do this. It's so important to have your team around you. I, I cannot stress it enough. And by the way, they should be in place before you're going to market, not after. Um, they, they're on your team. You're the boss and they'll, they'll execute your strategy, but you got to give them a chance. They're the experts. Let them do what you've hired them to do. We all work together. We stay in our lanes. I assure you, yes, I read the purchase agreements and the letter of intents. I look for business points, but I, I, I defer to Jack and, and the, the legal experts. And I assure you, I don't give accounting advice, but they you know, say, hey, Adam, you know, you manage the process, you manage the people, you manage the data rooms, you manage, you know, there, there could be 15, 20 people in a deal between both sides. That's our job is to keep it going, keep people accountable, keep these checklists, uh, get them populated. So having advisors around you for a transaction, either on the buy side or sell side, more important than ever with all the things going on right now. Another thing about the market is, You've read all these articles, seen the headlines. Oh, there's going to be this $10 trillion tsunami of baby boomers that are getting ready to sell. Well, hint, um, they're not. <laughs> they're not selling in the pace that anyone anticipated they would. Uh, partially because it's all they know. Partially baby boomers uh, don't have anything else to do. They don't have another purpose. Their life is their business. That's their identity. They don't have anything to go to. This is their control. They're in they're they're the boss. And they would rather just continue to keep the business uh, than contemplate going through and getting it ready for business. That's the 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 lack of inertia to, you know, they may not need the money. They um so they are it is happening. Most of our transactions last year were uh, the sellers were in their 50s, not their 70s. Um, and that's been several years running. So um, everyone who's waiting, and I, I get 
approached by buyers every week. Oh, we there's all these 70 and 80 year olds um, ready to sell. Some are, most aren't. And um, you know, Jack, uh, any anything you want to add to that, or, or I mean. You know, it's interesting. Another maybe good thing that came out of 2020 or necessarily COVID is the increased use of technology by the older generations. And I think that, and this is, um, uh, Gary's aware of this, uh, It's uh, my wife says a Jack theory, my kids say a dad theory, is that um, it has allowed the older generation to become more uh, user-friendly with technology. Uh, for example, my father being able to pull up his Panthers tickets and Charlotte FC tickets on his phone and me not have to tell him how to do that. And, you know, the delight that he has in being able to do that on his own and telling me via text once he got into the stadium the first time he did it. So those kind of things. But I think that what, what the reality is, is that these you know 67 year olds can now remote control their businesses somewhat. They don't have to be in the office every day. So they get the best of both worlds, which is sort of semi-retirement world and feeling, but being able to uh, check in on things remotely and make sure and look at the financials and look at you know all the reports and everything else remotely. Um, and then being able to communicate via video where they weren't able to before to talk to the people that are um, literally on the ground at their businesses. Um, and then being kind of the the norm of cheers for their business, which is they show up at the front door every once in a while. Everybody's like, hey, you know, how's it going kind of thing. And he sits, he or she sits at their office and checks on them th some things and then walks right out the door. We yeah. have a lot of those. And I know you do, yeah. all both of you do. So yeah. um, I think technology has been a game changer in a lot of ways. And I've said that before for a number of reasons. I agree. And let me, let so, me talk. Go ahead. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, the only thing I'd do is I'd, I'd glom in on that one because that that is an unexpected thing, but you nailed it. Um, I'm on the board of a company up in Ohio, and they were supposed to have a deal closed in Greenville, South Carolina, which is great. It's closer than Mentor, Ohio. But um, anyway, this guy is like, I think he's like 80 years old. You know, his wife died like he was taking care of her like he needs the money. But he, here we are, middle of March, and that thing still hasn't been closing. And it's because that dude has been dragging his feet and he, he needs to sell. And they've even created a place where he, like, and these are good people that are buying him. Like, they aren't going to be shoving him, you know, into the corner or, or promising what we usually hear. Hey, nothing's going to change, but everything changes as soon as the ink dries. You know, they, they, have, they have carved out a place for him to come. But it's just like that change comes so hard. So anyway, that's all I would say about that. I, you you brought up a very good point that I really hadn't thought about, but you you kind of nailed it. <laughs> so yeah. um, also one one thing that came through the chat from I think it's from Chris. Um, good point on BBs not selling and uh, you know baby boomers uh, and still working still. Uh, so how are the brokers adjusting, good question. If they do not sell now, it will just be deferred. So how might the landscape change in 10 years when they die or have to retire or sell? Good question. So it's a great question. And, you know, I, I take the approach of, I, I never ever tell anyone they should sell. I try to educate them on the pros and cons, but they need to be ready both personally, emotionally, socially they need to have an infrastructure so you know what i always tell people is hey if you're not ready now we're, we're going to be here we're going to be here next year we're going to be here the year after we're happy to you know continue to provide you a, a, an update on the value of your business um but you know the reality is is the we're adjusting by reminding people what they need to do when they're ready i can't force someone to sell a business um, some of the issues may exist in another five, 10 years. Um, the market uh, is very fluid. There's, there's, there's always buyers for businesses. It's a matter of how you reach fair market value. Um, so, you know, are we adjusting? Yes, uh, we may have more people in our funnel that are not committed to selling, but we're continuing to educate them. So when they are ready, when they feel the time is ready, or when they run into a health issue or uh, some issue or retirement age um, that they will be in a better position in the future than they are today. 
um, I hope that answers uh, answers the question. Uh, I want to come back and talk about uh, three or four other things that we're seeing in the market today um, that, that again, fall in the education um, uh, discussion. So we are seeing um, an uptick in internal deals and where the owner um, wants to sell to a long-term employee. And I would go back to what I said. Um, if you think doing an, a, a regular deal is unique when you have a stranger come in and look at your books, it's actually potentially dicier when it's one of your long-term employees. So there's a myth out there that you don't maybe need a an attorney or an advisor or a business broker or your you know all the advisors I mentioned earlier. You you actually need them more. Um, there are many conversations where. Um, I get asked by the owner to have a much more challenging conversation about money with the employee who is the buyer than a seller would be comfortable because they have a 10-year relationship. So I have to be, or anyone in my position, you know, we have to, it's, it's, it's sensitive and you want to make sure you're having real conversations. We need to vet them just like they're any random buyer. Do they have the money? Is the business going to survive? Are they going to take care of the employee? Employees is the seller. If the seller is taking a note, are they going to get paid? We have to vet them exactly the same way we do an external buyer, um, because these are legal financial transactions. And just because you're a ten-year employee doesn't mean that you're not going to be putting in a personal guarantee or signing in um, appropriate legal documents. And and so, uh, but we are seeing about twenty-five percent of our deals last year were internal sales. Um, so that's, that is something that we think will continue. Uh, there are lots of, you know, baby boomers that want to sell to an employee and many of them don't have an employee with, uh, the, the, the resources to do it. Uh, but that, that is always, uh, uh, an option. We talked about transition timelines being stretched, uh, and due diligence. Jack and I went over that, so we're not going to do that, uh, any further. I would like to tell you there, uh, consistent with any time there is good deal flow, um, there are always people that are going to approach you directly, whether it's a private equity, whether it's a strategic, whether it's a neighbor or a friend, or, you know, I want to buy a business to, you know, diversify with my other businesses. What I always tell every seller is always, always listen. But I, but I remind you, one is the loneliest number. And what do I mean by that is, is that if you're negotiating with one person, you have no leverage. There's no threat to that buyer to pay the maximum price of fair market value if you negotiate one-on-one -on -one as opposed to going out into a process where you have multiple people, many buyers going after your business. They may ultimately be the winner, but they have to know they're in a process so they are potentially going to pay fair market value. And so if you get approached, I always tell people, absolutely, always talk to them. And the second absolute is do not send them all your financials at all. Uh, that comes much later. They have to earn that. Um, but do not just negotiate with one person. You will not get fair market value. You may think it's the quick, quick route, and it may be quicker, but it may not be the best outcome uh, that you are seeking. Jack, I can see you want to chime in here. Yeah, just um, a couple of things on that. First, the, the last thing is definitely you don't share anything unless you have an NDA in place. Um, then uh, as far as buyers, um, you know, kind of sellers beware of those making promises that they ne necessarily cannot keep, meaning that um, and we see this a little more in the commercial real estate versus uh, just buying an asset purchase or stock purchase necessarily, but same concept, which is offering a, a crazy amount um, and then doing one of two things or both. One is is um, basically knocking down the purchase price once they do the due diligence to a, a point where they really thought they were going to be, but they just wanted to put pie in the sky numbers into your, you know, into your visual um uh in, in to you and then also um basically uh coming in without any way to finance or with with reasonable financing so they throw a number out there and they're like okay once we got you locked up and once we got you locked up with a no shop provision 
that doesn't allow you to go and, and ex even talk to others about a potential sale, the assets or the business, and they have you locked up for 60 days, 90 days, whatever it is. And then they go out and try to find the financing. And we've had some deals fail in, at the end of Q4 and beginning of Q1 uh, or beginning of this year, essentially, that um, ex exactly that happened, which was promises were made, um, evaluations were done. And for one reason or another, the bank wasn't going to give them the money, whether it was the fact that uh, the, the business and the assets weren't valued as much as um, was offered to so the bank said, we, do, we don't have enough collateral to give you that amount of money. Or it is that the the seller didn't or the buyer wasn't we didn't qualify for the funds. So all kinds of shenanigans going on. So just be aware of that. I mean, that's not to say to your point, which is you know you certainly want to have multiple suitors to have some leverage, but you also you know don't don't jump too far too fast with someone who's offering you something that is uh, somewhat unreasonable or unbelievable because it probably is unreasonable and unbelievable yeah. and likely not going to be funded by a bank. And, and we, the way we handle that is we tell buyers, listen, you're entitled to all the information and due diligence. You're just not entitled to it to when you necessarily request it. Uh, you've got to earn the right to get more information. I mean, we get people come in and say, oh, we're going to write a letter of intent, but I want you to fill the data room with these 27 items on the checklist. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, oh, I do have one more comment too about yeah. the data room that since you mentioned it, um, and we've talked about this in the past when we were talking about how to make your business more sexy and appealable and, and kind of thing for potential suitors. And that is um, the use of a virtual data room. So back in the old days, when I was a young baby lawyer, I would get parachuted into this room full of bankers boxes and have to manually go through things, make notes and report back to the partner who is running the deal. Um, the modern day version of that is to have a virtual data room and whether it is Google Docs or, you know, um, some of the others, we have a, a one that we use that we feel is very secure and is able, capable of tracking who's in and out, who's printed, who's done certain things and allows for us to create, um, and this is a, an old Catholic term, but a purgatory, a document purgatory, whereas you have the documents that are in the private side of things, you make sure they're okay, and then you launch them into the shared side of things, which would be buyer's counsel, buyer's CPAs, the buyer themselves. And so you create that environment. Um, so in preparation for a formal virtual data room, you might consider creating your own little data room with folders and things like that, because you can expect that if you're, if you're going to put yourself on the block for sale, you're going to have to provide three, four or five years, I would say three years potentially of tax returns, of your end financials, of you know, um, employment agreements. So those things that uh, normally go on in, in a transaction, you're going to have to start putting it together. So you give yourself an advantage of going and finding those things that may not even be in electronic format. Um, you know, this the material agreements that you entered into ten years ago that are on paper. You know, go ahead and scan those into into electronic form and have those ready. Um, you know, I'm not saying go do that just to do it just just in case i'm saying as you get closer to a potential transaction as you are that 50 year old or that 70 year old that is ready to sell uh that those are things that you're going to have to do so may as well um you know while you're watching um football or basketball or final well i shouldn't say final four you might you might end up uh, missing a page if you're scanning it while you're watching a basketball game or anything else so maybe during commercials how about that so yeah, you know, and I would just add that. to that, Jack. Um, Google Drive and Dropbox are not professional data rooms. Um, you may store your documents there, but that is not where, if you're not using an advisor, you should not be utilizing those. Those are not, um, reach out to your professional advisors around you. They'll make sure you're using data rooms. You know, everything is, should be recorded. Who accessed what? Because if there is, you know, we save all that metadata. So if some if someone comes back and says, oh, you never provided me this. We have the IP address and the date and the time exactly. Oh, you clicked on that exact file. Your attorney looked at it four times. You, you have no basis to say you haven't seen that document, which Jack was alluding to. So again, lean on your advisors to make sure you got the, the tools um, whether the, the advisor like myself or the attorney, uh, even the even you know accountant, um, we, we all have access to these resources. Um, I, I would just say uh, we touched on it earlier, and I, I want to spend a minute or two on it. Right now, uh, 
the biggest deal killer out there is not the buyer, it's not the lender, it's not the seller, it's not the attorney, it's not the CPA firm. Right now, as we speak, the biggest deal killer right now are landlords. They are two levels past aggressive. They are asking for personal guarantees and corporate guarantees in some cases. They are not letting the seller off of the lease and the, and the guarantee. They are requiring more collateral. They are, they are just, they've become much more invasive and they've become much more restrictive and they've been become a real challenge. And here's the best example I can give you. Um, let's I'm making all this up. So this does, this does not actually apply, but let's pretend you are in a warehouse lease and you're in the ninth year of a 10 year lease. And now all of a sudden um, you're getting ready to go to market. You go to market, you come up with a buyer for your, for your distribution business. And the new, and the landlord wants to meet the, the borrower, the buyer. And guess what's happened to real estate prices in the last 10 years on that commercial space? Let's say you got 50,000 square feet. We've seen 20, 30, 40% increases in landlord requests versus what the business is currently paying. Well, that's coming right out of cash flow. And the buyer's going to go back to the seller and say, look, I'd like to pay you X, but now all of a sudden I got to pay, you know, $300,000 more in rent a year, uh, That's that's got to come off the purchase price. We're seeing this happen. So um, landlords are, are, and by the way, if you're in Charlotte or the Southeast, um, landlords are in control right now. And they don't necessarily, um, they don't care. If you don't like the terms or the buyer doesn't like the terms, they'll lease it to someone else. There's no, there's not a lot of space out there. So you know, the way that we are advising clients to, to handle this is, first of all, always maintain a relationship with your landlord. Make sure, you know, you'd be amazed. Um, you Make sure you're, you're on time. If you pay on time and you have uh, a reasonable approach and, you know, most advisors like myself are also real estate brokers. So we understand the language because we negotiate leases of part of every deal. But we're potentially giving them a new long-term client. They don't want to move that warehouse. So they're getting a maybe a five or 10 year deal, but it's a change. And landlords are absolutely flexing their muscles in all types of space, retail, industrial, um, warehouse, you name it. They are flexing their space. Uh, they're, 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 um, they're, they're flexing right now because they can't. So you've got to keep this in mind. You've got to talk with your advisors early. You've got to get an idea. Maybe you start talking to your landlord before you go to market. What are you looking at in terms of a, of a rate for a new lease? These are things you need to know because you don't want this coming up at, you know, after you've got a letter of intent and now you reach out to your landlord and say, oh, by the way, and they say, oh, by the way, here's a 30% increase. So it's a very delicate conversation you don't want them to think you don't go and say oh you know what i'm going to go sell here soon you know that you, you don't want to tell the landlord that just say hey look we're thinking about an extension what what are you seeing out there in the market and 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 make sure that you're factoring that out with your advisors as you go to market because these are real issues and deals are absolutely dying over landlord issues jack i can tell you're chomping at the bit here. Well, I just want to reiterate some things that you said, which is, um, and you, you kind of said it in passing, but is maintaining the relationship with your landlord, even if they piss you off, I mean, it, which is hard to do sometimes, even if you've asked for things and they don't do it, even if the parking lot is falling apart and they don't fix it, um, because ultimately there will come a time where you are, are going to need them. I'm not saying that that's going to fix the problem, meaning getting their cooperation, uh, preemptively, you know, there's some things that you can do, which is in negotiating your lease or your lease renewal is put in some language that we typically put in um, lease addendum for uh, that franchisors insist upon with their the landlords of the tenants, which is their franchisees, which is the ability for the um, if 
there is a transition with their tenant that that franchisee is to allow the transfer to occur so long as the new tenant is and generally speaking um, as financially sound as the current tenant is so you have these okay yes it's assignable if a b c and d so they're credit worthy they will provide personal guarantees and so you kind of have a roadmap as to what are the factors Unfortunately, the last factor is, um, you know, and is uh, acceptable to landlord. Um, but then you put in a reasonableness, which is, um, you know, obviously there's things that are against the law, which is uh, uh, prejudice and, and and those kind of things. And and but there's, you know, if they are financially sound, they're going to pay the bill, then that's great. And to your point, Adam, it, you know, they have they will have someone there that is long term that they don't have to worry about. Um, you know, that uh, do up fitting the building and those kind of things. Another little caveat, which is interesting and in showing the leverage that landlords have is that, um, you know, in, in my mind, one of the biggest problems in a transition in relation to a premises to a, of lease space or purchase space is the HVAC system. And so I, I'm always with my clients saying, okay, go check it out, have it checked find out what the, the 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 longevity is the remaining life kind of thing because then you start negotiating what happens if something happens to it in the past it's been okay landlord's responsibility then it evolved to well tenant's responsibility if it has to be replaced and there and, and by the way there's a big difference between uh repair and replace and um, maintain okay those very simple words can mean a lot as far as who is responsible for what. And so I try to piece it, pull it apart between repair and replacement. And then who is responsible for that? Well, now it's evolved into, well, if it's a 10 year lease, you're in year seven, then we will pay for the use for the three years of the useful life. And then if we renew, then maybe we'll pay for the remainder kind of thing. What has evolved recently in, in a few deals, meaning like in the past several weeks, and I've checked with real estate brokers here in Charlotte is, hey, yeah, we'll give you tenant improvement allowance. Um, by the way, you're going to use that for the HVAC system. So basically, no TIA for true tenant improvements that are negotiated and to be done. And, you know, the, the landlords have the leverage. And it's like, OK, we were told, well, if you don't like it, then we have two other people that are willing to take the space. Uh, and so. Yes, it is. Um, unfortunately, it's it's kind of become a David versus Goliath kind of thing. Um, if it's something that, you know, for, on retail side that they want in that space, so I deal with a lot of franchises, then they'll be like, you, you may have a little more leverage, but for the most part, it is, if not you, someone else. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to just touch on a last a couple of things here before we, uh, Gary gives us the hook. Um, you know, Yes, you, you use a, a accountant, uh, et, et cetera, to like BGW to, to consolidate and organize your finances. But as a seller, you need to know your numbers. You need to be able to answer questions. And right now, there's a lot of um, uncertain sellers who are getting their tax returns back or filing or seeking an extension as they're looking at their 2022 numbers. And they may have had to pay more for labor and, and their cost of goods also went up due to supply chain issues and, and material increases. And, and all of a sudden their profits are down, uh, their cash flows down. And, and when you're talking with a buyer, th they expect you to know the answers instead of let me get back to you on that, because it just creates a little more uncertainty and doubt about you know, who's running this business? So if you're going to market, you got to really sit down and and look at your numbers, sit down with the folks at BGW or the professionals you're working with and really make sure, does this make sense? Can I explain this? Can do I, you know, I always say, can it go from the tax return to the PL to the bank statement or to the credit card to the bank statement? If it can do all those and you can walk someone through, you're good. If you can't, you need to be prepared. You need to know your numbers because buyers are going to ask you and they expect you to give prompt answers. Um, the last thing I'll say about structure and the market is, um, and no one likes to talk about it, so I, I feel like it's, it's my obligation to talk about it. And that is um, many deals have seller financing in them. 
or a potentially an earnout. Uh, earnout for larger deals, if they want you to stay around for one, two, three, four years, maybe you're keeping equity, you get X at close and Y down over the next you know several years. That's the common playbook of of strategics or private equity buyers. But seller financing, particularly in a higher interest rate environment, is more important, not less important. And I'm not suggesting that the structure is going to go all the way to seller financing. It's not. Um, but they may ask you to take a note for 10% or 15%, which one must be personally guaranteed by the buyer. That's the first mistake many people don't do. Do And make sure your attorney like Jack really holds the borrower, the buyer, to the, you're playing bank. So these need to be legal documents that they are going to be personally guaranteed. Does that mean potentially you could have liens on their homes or whatever? Yeah, I mean, you're the bank. Um, but two, with higher interest rates, um, you may be able to be uh, a little flexible. You may say, you know what, I, I'll, I'll take a, a note for three years at 6% when the market may be higher than that, particularly for an SBA or a conventional loan. So there's some flexibility there. Uh, your accountant uh, may say, you know what, it's, it's not, not such a bad thing to take some of that over three years, defer some of your, your gains. Again, I'm not playing accountant here, but seller financing uh, and earnouts are real. They've always been real, uh, but um, they're going to continue to be real. It gives confidence in the buyer uh, that this, the seller has confidence in this deal, that they will take back a, a small portion of the note. Again, I'm not suggesting 70, 80 percent seller financing, but don't be surprised if you go to market and, and the buyer does ask you to take a small percentage of note uh, seller financing, um, because that is a way to... Um, let the, bar, the buyer be more confident about uh, the seller during the transition. They know you're going to pick up the phone or respond to a text if you're getting a, a check for the next 36 months. So um, that continues to be uh, an option. Obviously, always we try to get as much cash at close, uh, but I wouldn't be being honest if I didn't say that you know, seller financing does play a role in, in some deals. And that's for small deals and large deals. Because um, that's that's just a way that the the buyer can get greater confidence uh, about the business and about the transition that the the seller is going to go through. Last thing I'll say on transition, um, that I'm seeing two extremes right now. Transition from from a seller uh, once the business has been bought, typically you know, month or two, maybe three months. Uh, sometimes you know, thirty, sixty days. Uh, but I am seeing some that are going out into a, to a year. After a year, unless you've got your rolling equity, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't recommend uh, much uh, longer than six months because you know everyone wants to sort of extend their elbows. Um, but uh, we are seeing some requests for um, when there's uh, either an earnout or a seller note that the people may, hey, instead of 30 or 60 days, we'd like you to stay six months. There's just been a lot of volatility in the market, and and they may not even keep you there full time, but they may want you to come in in months, you know, four or five and six, maybe ten hours a week, uh, or just be available. Um, so we're we're continuing to see that uh, it's a way to uh, appease and comfort buyers as they come into a new environment uh, of owning a new business. Adam, you never disappoint. Uh, that's why we have you on here. So, and same way with you, Jack. And I'm, you know, the Starbucks cards did, did wonders because it's nice and quiet back there. <clears throat> These people are not yelling. Yeah, there's a guy back there with a mask and somebody asked if it was Adam Boatsman, but and then they said, nah, he's wearing a jacket. And I'm like, yeah, he's not wearing a hoodie. So it's not Adam Boatsman back there. Yeah, it's um, starting to get noisy back here though. So, you know, they're about to open the doors in one minute. So we need to wrap yeah, this up. It, it's, it's not going to be good. Um, a couple more things. Um, Speaking, kind of tying it back to SVB, uh, buyers buy on cash flow, not potential. That was really powerful in what you said. Um, you know, Nobel Prizes are awarded for potential, but not businesses. So that's an important thing. And, you know, if, if the banks would have uh, kind of stuck to their knitting, too, that would have probably saved us some stuff, too, because potentials, you never know. I want to give a shout out to Derek. 
with U.S. Bank. So uh, Derek Painter has always been on here many times, so we appreciate that. But he did answer the question about the, hey, what about the FDIC? So, so here's his, his response. Checking savings, money market CDs, and official items issued by an, uh, an insured bank can be. The key is it has to be an FDIC in institution product. There are non-insured money market accounts and CDs out there that typically pay more but they don't have the coverage. And also that $250,000 of coverage is per depositor per bank. So if you've got two checking accounts in the same bank, you still only have 250,000 coverage for the accounts. So that's why you may want to spread uh, with you know stable banks. I wouldn't probably go over to SVB for big, <laughs> bigger returns, um, you know, never know. Uh, and then the final thing is, yeah, know your numbers. and. Listen, if you're if you're a BGW client, don't be afraid to ask dumb questions because they're not dumb questions. The only ones that aren't asked are dumb questions. We won't make you feel stupid. You know your business better than anybody else. You know your industry better than we do. We just are here to help you understand your numbers so you have that confidence. So um, anyway, that's all I'll say about that. We are at the uh, 12 o'clock hour. Thank you, everybody, for being on here. Next week is week 152. Adam, fantastic job again. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I don't know. Adam Boatsman is going to have to raise his game to, you know, match the Adam Plus, the Adam P, the Adam Plus. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Jack, anything else? I'm good, Adam. Thank you very much for joining us. I mean, the hour went by so quickly, and it's just like we were just, we could continue on the conversation for a long period of time, but I know people are wanting to go get some lunch. So um, yeah, thank yeah. you again. All right, guys, we'll put this up on the BGW CPA YouTube channel later on this afternoon for anybody that came in late or had to dump off a little early. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.